wrapping up our series, Keeping Score. We've been talking about keeping score in our relationships and our finances and with ourselves this last month. This series has challenged us to stop keeping a tally of who owes us what and what we think God owes us and what we deserve. Instead, it's invited us to choose the lose count, the lose count of offenses against us, forgive as Christ has called us to, to lose count of what our right hand has given, to freely open both hands and give back to God, amen, to lose count of our righteousness and acts of right living, to freely walk with sanctifying grace of Christ, and to lose count of failures and rest secure in God's grace and sovereignty. Um, In week one, we talked about we'll never be more like Jesus than we choose to forgive. Forgiveness is just like Jesus. So we have to be a church that forgives not only ourselves, but those around us, because that's what Jesus did. Week two, we talked about your money either controls you or you control it. We had a money talk this month. Some of you, tithing has come up. Amen. Praising God for that. And we talked about last week, nobody wins when we keep scoring our relationships, that marriage and things are hard when you're keeping score against the other person you're with. And today we're going, to keep, we're going to ask the question, does God keep score? Does God keep score with us? Anybody want to take a yes or no on that one? Shake your head. God doesn't? Actually, God does keep score with us. The Bible tells us that one day we're going to stand before him and give an account for every misspoken word and every misdeed and things like that. God does keep account. There is a record in heaven. But God takes no pleasure in that. It's not his will. God does not desire to judge us, but to forgive us. But often by our very choices, sometimes we don't leave God much of a choice because we say and do some things that we really shouldn't. Often we call that transgressing the will of God. So God does keep a record. There is a record one day. We have to be aware of that. We will give an account someday. So if you're the kind of person that's in the habit of letting your mouth get the best of you or you're in the habit of some unrepented sins and things like that, if, if you were to die, God will. He's going to ask you about those things. But God takes no pleasure in that whatsoever. So we're going to talk about what grace is this morning. And I'm going to share a little Wesleyan theology with you this morning. A few people have been asking, what does the Church of God believe? Um, in January, the whole entire state, all the Church of Gods in the state, are going to preach our seven imperatives. There's seven things that we absolutely will not compromise on, like Jesus and the Word and unity and holiness and so on. So the first seven weeks of the new year, we're going to talk about Church of God theology. But on the table down there, I put two books out this week. One is an introduction to the Church of God. It gives you a brief overview of what we believe. And the other book is on sanctification, something else we also believe in. So both of them are great little pamphlets on those subjects. So you can pick those up, you can read those. But this morning we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul is writing here to remind us that we're saved by grace, amen. And grace is God's unmerited favor, that we don't earn it, we don't deserve it. There's nothing you could do to get it. That God gives it to us freely. So read with me Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in his mercy because of the great love which he has loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, have made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with us, and seated with us him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable richness of his grace and the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, this is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture here, amen? And Paul is saying this morning that keeping score on our past prevents Christ from giving you a future. So many of us, we, we, we try to walk with Jesus, and, and this idea that we're forgiven, this idea of justification, this idea that God in Christ Jesus declares you righteous and forgives you of your sins and past when you place your faith in Jesus, some of us, we, we get that, but, the, but we still, there's parts of our lives that we can't overcome. So maybe this morning, I want to let you know that maybe this morning you got a little shame. 
You, you got a little guilt. You got, you, got, you got just a little bit of that worldly baggage that's kind of hanging on, and, and you're trying to carry that into your relationship with Jesus, and I want you to know this morning that, that that's not God's will for you, that God in Christ Jesus doesn't want you to experience guilt and shame. He wants you to release that baggage for by grace you've been saved. This is the condition of our past, though, because Paul's reminding us that before Christ Jesus, and this is my personal testimony, I was dead in my trespasses and sin. Anybody with me? In which we once walked, following the course of this world. You know, living my life before Jesus, where I did whatever the world said was okay to do, I'm like, hey, all right, let's do it. You know, hanging out with the wrong people, you know, drugs, drinking, you know, sex before marriage, outside of Christian marriage. I mean, I did, I did all those things before Jesus. I was as dead in my trespasses as you could possibly be. But Paul says we all were before Christ Jesus. Maybe your sins weren't as crazy as my young man's sins I had back then, but maybe there's something else in your life this morning. We were all sons of disobedience. Like, like we, 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 we just realized this, the sin in this world, and the world around us is full of sin and evil. It is, there, there's so much temptation, and the world around us entices us to sin. Entices us to sin. There, there's so many people that good, good Christians, people who, who would say they love the Lord, and, and they're trying to follow Jesus, but they're still sleeping together before they're married. As if when they get in the bedroom, they become Christian atheists for a moment. And then, but they, they still follow Jesus, and it's because, why? Because the world tells us that sex before marriage is okay. It's, a, it's everywhere. The world is redefining sex in and, and, and so many different ways. It, it can be awfully confusing nowadays, but we know that when we read the scripture, God clearly defines what it is. So the world entices us always to walk away from God. Satan, our enemy, has been playing the same game since the beginning. Did God really say? Did God really say that's wrong? And it's not just that kind of stuff, but it's it's things, it's how we dress, it's how we act, it's the music and movies and social things and, and things we entertain ourselves with. I mean, I remember when I was younger, I really liked, I really liked rap music. I don't know why I did for a season, but as a teenager, I like rap music, and I listen to Tupac and all that kind of stuff, and let me tell you something, those lyrics are not godly, they're not Christ-like, and I had to make a decision when I became a Christian. I still, for, I, did, I did what most Christians do, I'm guilty of this, I listened to a lot of rock and roll and metal and rap, and a lot of, I listened to a lot of music that wasn't Christ-like back then, and what I would say is I'd use this line, it doesn't make me struggle as if that was my excuse to do it. So I could talk myself into it. I could listen to music that had bad lyrics. I could, I could listen to really crazy heavy metal music and all this kind of stuff. And, I, and, I, and when my wife or somebody would call me on and say, you know what, how does the Holy Spirit feel about that? I'd be like, does it make me struggle? And I would excuse myself, right? Anybody ever done that? You can excuse me. And then I had to realize that, guess what? It's not about what makes me struggle. It's like, does it make Jesus struggle? See, is the thing I'm watching or the thing I'm listening to or the thing I'm doing, is it okay with Jesus? Because that's really what matters. Is it okay with the Holy Spirit? Am I grieving the Holy Spirit inside of me with this thing that I'm doing? Well, if the answer to that question is yes, then it doesn't matter how I try and get myself out of it. I got a problem. I'm still walking in disobedience. And there's many people who, who, who start their journey with Christ and they begin going to church and like that, but they still have a strong pull in the world. We would actually call those kind of people carnal Christians. They're trying to follow Jesus, but there's still a whole lot of worldliness inside of them that they're struggling with. We do that with our addictions. You know, there's things that we allow into our bodies and things like that that are not good. You know, overeating or, or smoking or drugs or even alcohol. A lot of Christians make excuse for alcohol and don't think that getting drunk and these things are wrong because everybody in the world's doing it. And it's like we have to understand that we are the salt and the light, which means it's our job to flavor culture, not culture's job to flavor us. 
So if I'm walking with Jesus, I'm supposed to be setting an example that something changed inside of me, that the disobedience and the sin that was in my life is no longer there anymore, that something changed. Like light doesn't have anything to do with darkness, right? But, but, if, but if I'm living my life, I'm coming to church on Sunday morning, and I'm like, yeah, praise him again and again, and I'm praising him. But then the rest of the week, I'm as worldly as anybody else. I might be fooling the people in church on Sunday morning, but I'm not fooling Jesus, Holiness matters. Holy living matters. Sanctification, we'll talk about that this morning. So while the world entices us to sin day in and day out, Christ is in us. We have to clothe ourselves with Christ. And the only way we're going to defeat the sin and the temptation and the things that Paul says makes us sons of disobedience is that we clothe ourselves with Christ and we stop letting culture influence us and we start influencing culture, which guess what? As a Christian, you're meant to be countercultural. So if the, whole cu- if the whole culture is going down the bridge of redefining sexuality, we're supposed to head in the other direction and say, no, holiness matters. The Bible says to keep the marriage but holy, First Peter. And we're, we're supposed to do something different. And I know as a Christian nowadays, it's hard at times, isn't it? It's almost like, well, everybody else is doing it. I don't know how many times I hear, well, everybody else is doing it. it I just want you to know this morning that if, if Jesus has a problem with it, it's a problem. But the real problem is the prince of the power to air the devil. I mean, we have an enemy, the Bible says. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 5, 8. Says this, be sober-minded and be watchful for your adversary. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Like, we have an enemy. We have somebody who's forever trying to attack us. And, and not only us, but he's, he's done every man of God in Scripture. He's tried to wait. He took Jesus himself in the desert. During those 40 days, he tempted Jesus. Like, Jesus is no stranger to temptation. And the enemy is always playing the same game with you. Did God really say? What did he say to Adam and Eve in the garden? Oh, God didn't really mean that. Oh, God is just trying to prevent you from having fun, so you should do it because you, you want to have fun and so on. Like, he's always trying to convince you. Like, like if there's something in your life that's taking you away from Jesus, a relationship, a person, an activity, whatever it is, and, and maybe you're enjoying it. Maybe that's the problem is this thing is taking you away from the Lord and, and you're enjoying that thing. But I'll tell you, it's not from the Lord. Because the Lord will never give you something that takes, him, takes you away from him. The Lord is always drawing you to him. Which, this is the problem I see so often in the world is like, you know, sex before marriage or even being married, you know. You know, life's too short not to have an adultery, right? This is what the commercial says. And people talk themselves into flirting at work and, and doing all kinds of things. Everybody else is doing it. Oh, everybody else is doing it, right? You hear that all the time. It still doesn't make it right. Like, does holiness matter? Does living a sanctified, set-apart life, does, does that matter? Anything that takes us away from Christ isn't from Christ, and that's not what he has for you. But what's the cure? And Paul says the cure is repentance. The, the cure is owning and confessing that there's a problem. Only in confessing that, that I have a sin nature that needs to be dealt with. And, and even when I first become a Christian, I still got to deal with my sin nature. It takes time. Sanctification takes time. But it's a desire daily to say, okay, Lord, I'm confessing and owning my sin. Lord, lead me away from temptation. Deliver me from evil. Take me down the path of righteousness. Like That's something that we should pray for always. Lord, lead me away from it is. Lord, if I'm in the habit of watching things on TV... Lord, then, then, then help me get rid of it. You know, I, I hate, like, this, this, this more popular one recently, and, and not to pick on anybody who's gone to the screen park recently, but the theme for the screen park is dark baptism. Now, I don't have a problem with haunted houses. I've been to a gazillion of them. But I have to wonder for a second. A dark baptism is this satanic version of our baptism. When you enter a dark baptism, you are giving your life to Satan. That's what it is. And they do it for infants. It's for babies. So why the local screen park decided to use an actual satanic ritual as their theme for the year kind of makes me wonder either they don't know or they knew. And how how many people are going there, walking in the middle of that, taking part in this, not realizing what what, what they're actually doing, that light has nothing to do with darkness. 
Like, I can't say I follow Jesus if I'm, if I'm hanging out with the devil and enticing the devil. Like, there has to be a part of me that says, you know what, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I shouldn't be okay with the things that the world's okay with. I, I have to say, you know what, I don't want that kind of baptism in my life, no matter what it is. And I mean this for even for Halloween coming up, like dressing our kids up and things like that. Like, yeah, there's lots of playful things you could do, but do I really want to dress my kids up as a demon? A vampire? Satan himself? Little devils walking around? Scary clowns and all this kind of demonic stuff? See, what it is, is like, it is demonic. It's meant to be demonic. That's the purpose of it. But because everybody's doing it, we as parents are like, eh, what's the big deal? And I have to wonder, does God look down and say, man, I don't know if I agree with that. Because Jesus repeatedly makes the case, what does light have to do with darkness? Isn't there a line we should draw on the sand? There's a gazillion other things you could do for Halloween than dress up as Satan himself. Or witches, wizards, magic, demons. Isn't there a line that we should draw? Isn't there some part of our, our character that just like watching, the, watching certain movies, like when I was growing up around Halloween time, horror movies, they were a whole lot tamer than they are nowadays. Nowadays, man, it's nuts what you can watch. And it's like this time of the year, I was on Dish Network last night, flipping between the Blackhawks game, and I went through the movies that we can rent, because you can rent movies on Dish. And like, like, like out of the 20-something movies, 19 of them were all demonic-related. They were every kind of haunted movie, every kind of exorcist movie, every kind of witch movie. It's just repeatedly. Now, I know that if, if I get up to saying this about Halloween, instantly somebody's going to be upset with me. They're going to say, how dare you pick on Halloween? What's the big deal? And I'm just saying, I'm not telling you not to celebrate, not to do what you want. I'm just telling you that, man, you should wonder if, if you're being a salt and light. You should wonder if darkness is overtaking your house and putting the light out. Because do your neighbors then look at you like, hey, my kids, look at my kids, they're dressed like little demons. And I wonder if your neighbor who's wondering about Jesus says, how's that jive? How's that drive? So the cure starts with ownership. We've got to take ownership. But here's the condition of our presence. Oh, that sounds like bad news, right? Bob's picking on Halloween. He's talking about sin. Like, like right? This all sounds like bad stuff. But here's the condition of our presence. Ephesians 2, 4, and 7 says this. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has for us, even though we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ, by grace you've been saved. And raised up with him, seated with him in the heavenly places. Like, I don't know if I could get in the heavenly places dressed like a demon. Like, how's it, like, I don't know if I do that. I don't know if I could put on my best scary clown costume this morning. And my wife really hates scary clowns. And be like, okay, I'm going to the heavenly places. I don't think it works that way, guys. And, and here he says, raised up with him, seated in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God, amen? A sinner saved by the grace of God. And Paul's life, this is the apostle Paul writing this message, Paul was not a Christian. He was a religious zealot who persecuted the church, who wanted the church to die, even persecuted Christians to the point of death until Jesus got a hold of him on the Damascus Road, the book of Acts says, and turned his whole life upside down, and Paul becomes one of the greatest the apostles. So Paul's writing a testament. Paul understands what it's like to be a sinner. And like, I'm a sinner. I know what it's like to have God's grace wash over me and cleanse me of my sins. And that's what brings me my joy and my salvation. That's what gets me fired up. I know that while I was wretched, God still loved me, amen? And he still loves you. So Romans 5 eight says, for God shows his love to us that while we're still sinners, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. I think these are words we need to hear over and over again. That Jesus loves you this morning. That Christ died for you this morning. That we're saved by grace. You know, John Wesley, the famous Wesleyan theologian, described the working of God's grace by what he called the means of grace. 
There's some things that we believe that God does, and, and the first grace, this first expression of grace, we call prevenient grace, which means before, which means there's this point in your life, and I had this point where, where I wasn't a Christian, but I felt the tug of God on my heart. You know, that's, that's the moment where it's like, 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 I begin feeling like something's going on in my heart, so like, I got to get to church. And, and, and God begins softening your heart, and it's this prevenient grace that God does where, he, where the Holy Spirit begins to work on you to bring you to salvation. It begins softening your heart, and this is often the most challenging part for people because you start feeling that tug, like, man, I, I got to get right with God. But everything inside of you is like, I don't want to do that. And I remember when I got invited for the church the first time, I had that. God was working on me. I had, I had that prevenient grace going on in my life. I, I, I knew when I got the invite, I knew I should go, but, but the worldly side of me is like, I don't really want to do that. So I said no a few times until I got convinced to go, and I praise God that God begins working on you to bring you to what we call saving grace. This is justification. This is, this is justifying grace. This is where you, you, you actually make it into church. Or you make it someplace, and, and somebody actually shares the gospel with you, and they tell you, man, by God's richness of grace, he sent Christ Jesus to die for you, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you, and you know what? Something in you wells up, you're like, that's really good news. And you get excited. And in that moment, you make the best decision of your life, saying, you know what, I need Jesus. So I'm going to confess Jesus, Lord and Savior, and God's justifying grace washes over you because the minute you repent of your sins, the minute you call on the name of Jesus for salvation, and that moment you are fully justified before God, which means everything you've done to that moment up to the past is gone. It's wonderful, isn't it? The minute I repent of my sins and call the name of Jesus, God forgives in such a, a mighty way that no matter what I did, no matter how much shame, no matter guilt, no matter just all of it, it all just gets wiped completely clean. See, God had a record of wrongs with me, but in the moment I repented and accepted Jesus, that record got taken care of. I often said it's like this. I go, I'm in a courtroom and I'm standing before God, and here I am before God, and I'm a guilty sinner. And the devil, he's the attorney, he's the prosecutor, he's over here, he's like, okay, the court's in session. And he goes to God, God, let me tell you everything that Bob did. Bob was a drunkard, he did drugs, he hung out with gays, he, he committed adultery, he, did, he was, da, 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 da. and then Jesus is over here saying, nope. God opens up his book. Satan's expecting that book to have all that in there, and he's all prideful. The book opens up, the page is covered in blood. God's like, I don't see it. That's what happens in salvation. That's, that's our justification. Like We were guilty, but we're not guilty anymore. So God does this prevenient thing where he brings us, the saving thing that he does in us, but then he gives us this thing that we call sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace is this, that I, I come to Christ Jesus as a baby who doesn't know anything. I can barely crawl. I don't understand the word. I'm not sure. Communion's weird. Foot washing's weird. All this stuff is just, just new to me, and I'm not sure what to do with it. But the Holy Spirit begins working on me. And the more we follow Jesus, the more this sanctification process takes place where my heart begins to change. And the more I desire to follow Jesus, the less I desire the things I wanted before, the more I begin to change. And you know what? God does his work on me where it's like all of a sudden, a day, I remember back then, I thought the sanctification, I noticed people who believe in entire sanctification preached in a way that all of a sudden you as a Christian have this magical moment where the lights flash and heaven opens up and, and you just had this one moment where you desire to sin no more and you never sin for the rest of your life. I'm not denying that some people have that experience, but my experience has been progressive sanctification, which means from the time I gave my life to Jesus to still today, God is working on me. Man, I praise God for that. My gosh, I praise God for that. And here's the thing, like we have to be okay with God working on us. We have to be okay that, okay, here's the deal. Maybe I messed up yesterday, but today's a new day. God gives us in his grace, which is, here's the thing, you can't earn it. This is the wonderful thing about it. Like, right, you, your kids, you get this with your kids, your, your kids cannot earn your love, right? Harley could be the best little girl ever, and Morgan's not going to love her any more or any less. We, we just love our kids. Now, yes, we want them to be well-behaved and be good and, and so on, but 
we, we love them. We just do. When my granddaughters were born, it was like instant love. At that moment, I think I understood God's love more than I did when I first had my kids. Not that I understand about them, but I remember when Isabel was born, and we got to hold her for the first time. It was like, I just love this kid. I don't know anything about her. I don't know what her future. I just know that she's sassy at times. The other day she called me. She's jumping in her bed saying happy birthday, and she's all excited to say happy birthday to Grandpa, and I'm just so, I'm so in love with that. I think it's the coolest thing ever. But she, she could do no wrong. <laughs> like, I'm just going to love her. And that's how God is with us. Like, God loves us so much that he knows who we can become. See, he knows that we can become more like Jesus. So God does the sanctifying work in our lives that the more we surrender to him, the more he sanctifies us, which means holiness is possible. But what it means is I have to consecrate myself. I have to, I have to do a Paul saying here. I have to make a decision that Jesus is worth more than everything the world offers, which means I'm going to live countercultural, which means I'm just not going to watch, listen to, and do some things everybody else is doing because I'm more worried about pleasing Jesus and my holiness than I am about what fun I can have. That's why we, we in our household, we don't celebrate Halloween. What does darkness have to do with light? We just, it's a decision I made. I can't justify it before God. So, so we don't. We don't dress up. We don't do that kind of stuff. My kids have never worn a demonic outfit ever, although they've tried to convince us a couple times, especially back when, when scary clowns were real popular and John and all his friends are wearing scary clown costumes. And we're like, nope, it's not going to happen. I make a decision. He praised God this morning for grace. And God gives us these means of grace, these, these super important things that he begins to give us. And there's, there's things that God says, okay, so God does this graceful work in our life where he brings us Jesus, he justifies us, he begins to do this work in our lives, he changes us, but then he gives us some means of grace, some kind of means of grace. He gives us some things that, that help us along the way. And the first one of those means is prayer. Prayer is the way God communicates with us. It's also the way we communicate with each other. So whether you're praying individual or corporate prayer, prayer is what we call a means of grace because prayer opens up the channel between us and God. And this is so important, as I talked about a few weeks ago, like, like, like the people of the Old Testament, they could not go to God that way. There was a veil, there's just things in the way, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, when I pray and say, Father, God, is, we have this channel opens up. And God listens and he talks. And, and, and here's the thing. Have you been silent enough lately to hear God talking back to you? Are you so busy that you don't hear God talk? Because, you know, a lot of times prayer is being, is being silent. That's a lot of times I sit here when I'm praying for all you guys, or I sit for a long period of time and don't say a single word. Because so I'm like, God, I just want to hear from you. And this is what the Holy Spirit begins to speak. And the Holy Spirit does a couple of things. The second means the grace is Scripture. Like when you search Scripture, God speaks to you. God uses his holy word to re- rebuke, correct, encourage, and train you in righteousness. So you have prayer and the word, the two means of grace that God wants to communicate with you and help you grow. What are the two things that most Christians are missing nowadays? And we wonder why we don't see the transformation that we should see. The second, third one is the sacraments of the Lord's Supper. That's a means of grace. We do this to remember Jesus. Number four is baptism. Have you been baptized as a confessing adult, as a believer? Have you been baptized making your own decision for Jesus? It's in baptism, Romans 6, that we get buried with Christ and risen to a new life. That everything, baptism is this wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, we got Chris is going to get baptized here shortly this next month. Um, where you get in the water and the boss says, all that shame and guilt and past, all that baggage, all that nonsense, all that just junk that I carry with me, because it's been justified, I can just get that washed away. It's like when I'm washing my car out there, man, and washing those bugs off the front of the car. Like, you know what, sometimes I got to scrub them. Sometimes I got to scrub them, but I don't give up. <laughs> like the Lord does this a beautiful thing in baptism where, where, where everything that was in your past gets just cleansed and washed away. And when you come out of those waters, you come out of those waters with this, this, just, this joy of your salvation, knowing that it was dealt with with Jesus. And he says, now you could go on with this sanctifying work in your life and you get to live life. 
life abundantly, life in Jesus Christ, but it comes with decisions because the fifth means the grace is church and fellowship. God uses church and fellowship to grow you in your faith. Like, like when we come to church, and church is so twisted nowadays. I know, I know some people view church as like, it's a chore. Oh, I got to get up and go to church this morning. Church is so much more than that. This is a place where you find encouragement. You find a group of people that, that if we're doing it right, loves you, wants to encourage you, wants to pray for you, wants to, wants to reach out to you, wants to see you do well. This is, this is where we find discipleship in the church. Like, like Wednesday night, like Sunday morning, I, I preach for lost people, I preach for a lot of people, but on Wednesday night, you come in and you study the Bible. And some of you were coming in and studying the Bible, realizing this is really what it's all about, that I'm in a room full of people being discipled, that I'm growing in my faith because, because I'm asking questions and getting answers, and I'm, and I'm sharing what the Lord is speaking to me. These are things that God gives us in our life. These are things that we call means of grace. They're things that God gives us that bring us closer to Jesus and make us more Christ-like. Which ones are you tapping into? Ephesians 2 is this. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Grace. And it's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, amen? It's amen. Maybe you're in church this morning, and you're like, oh, I just don't feel like I'm ever good enough. You ever feel like that? You're never good enough? I just don't feel like I'm ever good enough. Oh, I can't. and God says, it's not about you. See, grace means it's not about you. It means you can't earn it. And guess what? You really don't deserve it. Like, we don't deserve the grace God gives us, but God gives it to us anyways. It's a gift. The Lord looks at you and says, you are totally worth it. It's also my son for you. And God begins his work in our lives. And it's, it's by grace we've been saved. It's, it's the unmerited favor of God. Like you're here this morning because God chose you and he wants a relationship with you and he wants to do something in your life. He's waiting for you to stop fighting him. I know some of you guys, you've got some things that you need to be set free of. And the Lord's waiting for you to say, take it. But you got to mean it. So many times we're like, oh, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm transgressing. And, Lord, I got this thing in my life. It's a struggle. And we kind of half-heartedly pray, like, Lord, take it while we're holding on to it. And the Lord's like, no, you, you need to give it up completely. Like, there has to be a moment in your life where you take the thing that you shouldn't have and you really do lay that down at the altar so that the Holy Spirit can begin to sanctify that out of you. You understand that? He wants to do that work in you, but we, so often we fight it. And we fight it because there's some things in our life that we're doing that we know we shouldn't be doing. There's some attitudes that we have that we know we shouldn't have. We talked about them this month, right? You can't, you will never forgive others around you if you don't understand grace. Because it takes a lot of grace to forgive somebody who's wronged you. But you could do it if you're following Jesus. You are never going to give God any bit of a tithe or any, or any really sacrificial amount of anything if you don't understand grace. Because if you don't understand how good he is and how good he's been to you, you're just not going to do it. But when you understand how much grace God has afforded you, it becomes a whole lot easier to give back to God. You almost want to because he said, test me. And you know what the other one is? His one Relationships relationships thrive on grace they thrive on grace you you can't have a good relationship with somebody without having a bunch of grace anybody in here married this morning you know what i'm talking about like like okay, okay raise your hand back there i get it so start praying for ellen every day <laughs> but grace relationships take a lot of grace and how do we get to that kind of grace? How do I get to the kind of grace in my life where maybe I, maybe I have that kind of, that unforgiving attitude, right? And I, and I tend to, when somebody, this is how I was. When somebody offends me, I'm like, let's get, I'm like, let's fight. If somebody says something cross to me when I was younger, I'm like, man, I got something to say to you. I could be as sarcastic with the best of them, right? I, and you know what? I, and I still struggle with that. I so often have to pray and say, God, you got to take that away from me. i got to give it up, Lord. Like, I can't have it. If it's not of you, Lord, because here's the thing. We are created for his workmanship. 
Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works is not only the means of grace. It's, it's good works is not also studying your Bible, reading scripture, praying, going to church, taking communion, being baptized, foot washing, those things that we believe in. But good works is also you just living for Jesus. It's the decision that you're making every single day to be more Christ-like than morally. It's the things that you do for the people around you where you're generally loving people and you're loving God and you're, you're, just, you're trying to be like Jesus. That's good works. It's when we understand that we're gifted spiritually. And everybody in this room has something that God wants you to do. It's another one of his means of grace. God gifts you spiritually. And you have a spiritual gift. And that gift is meant for the edification and the building of the church. It's meant to change the world. You were created by God for so much more than just salvation, but a salvation that's lived out by doing good things. Our faith isn't a Sunday morning faith. It's never meant to be. The church isn't the building. This building means absolutely nothing. The church is the people of God on mission for God. You're the church, and you were created for Christ. Christ created you for himself. He created you for the salvation you received. He created you for the sanctification he's trying to do in you, and he created you to be a difference maker in the world around you, that when you're loving and you're serving, you're out there, you represent Jesus. So are you on team Jesus this morning, or are you in team world? Are you on team Jesus this morning, or are you on team something else? What is it that you're really known for? And I'm not talking about no one here in the church. I'm talking about what are, what are the people in your life really know you for? If I were to go back here with Andrew this morning and pull your kids and say, tell me what mom and dad are known for, what would they say? Would the first thing out of their mouth be like they're known for Christ following? Or is it something else? If I were to ask your coworkers or your neighbors or the people around you, if they thought you represented Jesus, if when they saw you, they thought they saw Jesus in you, would they say yes or no? Or maybe they say, I don't know. Are you on team Jesus this morning? Does your life reflect his grace? Are you living for him? Are you allowing him to sanctify you and change you and to gift you and use you? Is it this morning about him? Is it? I'll tell you, for me it is. There's no better place. We will never choose to forgive like Christ if we don't understand grace. We'll never be generous without grace. We'll never have life-giving relationships without grace. And we'll never stop keeping score until we understand grace because we will never fully live for God until we accept his grace, which means you have to first this morning choose that you are worth it. He loves you. He wants to pour his grace on you. You need to stop running away. What is it God wants to do in your life this morning that he's like, he's just waiting for you to surrender? Let's pray. Now, I know this morning, I, I believe this 100%. I, I know that there's some of you in the church this morning that you need God to do a work in your life, but you need to give something up. You, you need God to do something in your life this morning, but you got to give something up. You, you need God to sanctify something out of your life, but, but he's waiting for you to give up. I want you guys to stop and think for a second. Like, close your eyes for a second. What is the very thing right now the Lord is speaking to you that says, it's got to go? What choice have you been making lately where the Lord's like, you need to stop making that choice? What is it in your life this morning where the Lord is saying, is, this is getting in the way, but he wants to move it? Will you, in the next few moments, allow him to move it for you? I want you to pray this one. Say, Holy Spirit, come and take it. Holy Spirit, cleanse me, forgive me, change me. Do you desire the means of grace this morning? Do you desire to pray and get in the word, to have fellowship? Have you been baptized yet? Do you desire to walk in the things that the Lord has for you this morning? If your desire is kind of low this morning, you need to pray for the desire. God, we pray this morning. 
God, I thank you so much for your grace. God, I thank you so much that you love us in a way that we don't have to earn it, we don't deserve it. God, you pour it on us as a gift. God, I pray for a people here, including myself, God, that we would choose your grace. We would want your grace. We would desire it. Lord, I pray for just the worldliness that's in the church, that's in some of our lives, these, these things that we're saying yes to that we shouldn't, that rob us from holiness, they rob us of Christ-likeness, like, like there's things that we shouldn't be doing that for some reason we're making an excuse, for some reason we lack the conviction. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning that you would bring the conviction. Lord, I pray as, as we know that the way your grace works, that you begin to convict the heart this morning, but Lord, help us this morning to say yes to you, help us to repent, help us to turn our lives over to you, help Help us to accept your grace, Lord. I pray that we would hold on to nothing this world has to offer, that you would have free reign in each of our hearts to sanctify us, to cleanse us, to transform us, to make us the best versions of Jesus we can be on this side of heaven until that day of perfection comes when we stand before you. Lord, I pray none of us this morning would choose to have a record of wrongs or a record with you, that we'd want to be right with you. And Lord, I pray that if we lack conviction on holiness and we're saying yes to the things of the world, then, Lord, I pray that you would do whatever it takes, God, to bring us back to you this morning. God, we praise you for your grace and your forgiveness. We praise you for your mercy. And, Lord, I pray for this Halloween season, as there's so much darkness around us and so many people that are being enticed by demonic things, Lord, that you would help us to walk in the light and be an example. Lord, it's okay to say no to what culture says yes to because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be countercultural. Lord, help us to teach our kids to honor you before they honor the world. And Lord, I pray against those kind of things that we see in our community, those kind of demonic, evil things. Lord, I pray that this Halloween season, maybe we would just see some people just repent, accept grace, and turn their lives over to Jesus versus practicing evil. God, we pray that for the world around us and where we live in as we continue to pray for peace on the other side of the world and we continue to pray for the end of conflict, the end of terrorism and these kind of things. Lord, Lord, we know the world is broken because we humans make broken choices. So Lord, we pray this morning that you would sanctify us and help us make the right choice. Lord, thank you for your favor this morning, for loving us so much that we don't earn it, we don't deserve it, you just give it to us. But Lord, help us not to squander it, Lord but to be serious about it. In Jesus' name, amen.